All right, 1 Kings. In the Word of God tonight, amen. I believe I'll start in verse 1. I'm going to be reading quite a bit of Scripture to you, so uh, you might want to keep your Bible open so you can follow along, amen. So beginning with verse 1. Now, David's strength at this point is beginning to decline. He's getting up in years. Uh, it won't be too, too much longer that uh, King David is going to uh, pass away. Amen. And so, verse 1, it says, Now King David was old and stricken in years. And they covered him with clo- uh, clothes or cloths. Is that cloth or clothes? Clothes, thank you. But he could not get warm. Wherefore his servant said unto him, Let there be sought for my lord the king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord the king may get warm. So they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the borders of Israel, and found uh, Abishag the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. And the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. Brother Dice used to say this, you know David was about about dead because when this uh, young woman, (laughs) anyway, he didn't do anything. Hallelujah. (laughs) You you know he was dead when he didn't do anything, especially King David. Amen. (laughs) That's what Brother Dice used to say. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb. Uh, verse 5, <laughs> then Adonijah, the son of Haggath, exalted himself, saying, I will be king, and he prepared chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very handsome man, and his mother bore him after Absalom. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zerui, uh, and with Abiathar, the priest. And they following Adonijah helped him. But Zadok, the priest, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan, the prophet, and Shimei, and Rei, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. Adonijah slew sheep. And oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zohilith, which is by Enrogel, and invited all his brethren, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. But Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, and the mighty men, and Solomon his brother, he invited not. Amen. The title of the message is Dwelling Places in a Coup d'etat. Dwelling places in a coup d'etat. Now that's spelled C-O-U-P-D-E-T-A-T. Coup d'etat or a coup. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now and ask your blessings to be upon the reading of your holy word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, Hi, uh, uh, dwelling places in a coup d'etat. Hallelujah. How many of y'all know what a coup d'etat is? Oh, boy. That's a government overthrow. And so what we have here is we have the fourth son of David. This is David's oldest son. His name is Adonijah. He is going to make himself a king. And obviously David is fixing to pass away. Uh, Solomon has already been anointed to be the king. And it has been promised to Solomon that he would be the king that would follow David. So that's already in the works. It's already planned out. It's already laid out as to who the successor of David would be. But Adonijah, the oldest son of David, desires to be the king. So he steps in and he tries to create a coup d'etat, overthrow of the government. And he's got a few people that are joining with him. One of them is Joab. Now Joab was the chief general of David. And if I remember correctly, I didn't check this, but I think that Joab was David's nephew. And so what we have is that we have Adonijah, and then we got Joab, that's David's chief general. And then we have Abiathar, the priest, and they're following Adonijah, and they're going to try to help him 
to overthrow or have this coup d'etat. Now, what is interesting when you study this in depth is I felt led of God to preach this area of the Word of God to you. When you look at the, word, the name Adonijah, the name Adonijah means the Lord is Yahweh. It's very, very interesting. The Lord is Yahweh. And so he's going to seek to overthrow the government here and be the next king. He's going to self-exalt himself. Uh, he's going to usurp the throne of David. He uh, is also a man that in this process who declares to be king, he is never anointed. So we have a picture of a man who's in the flesh, and he is seeking to overthrow the government in a coup d'etat. He is not anointed by God. He's not chosen by God to fill that place of David, but he takes it upon himself. Amen. He exalts his flesh. He exalts himself. There is no anointing. There is no selection by God. This is all about Adonijah. And he's getting Joab. He's getting as many people as he can to help him to overthrow uh, the government of David, ultimately Solomon's kingship. Now, when you look at this, what we're going to see is that the false is going to be determined by the true. So we see this man as a false. He's a false leader uh, seeking to overthrow. And the Bible tells us that he's got some help that are involved with this. He's going to throw a, a big old meal, etc. And then verse 10, but it tells us that there are some that are with David. And that's Nathan the prophet and Benaiah and the mighty men and Solomon his brother he invited not. Amen. So in this coup d'etat, this overthrow of government by Adonijah, the self-exalted usurper of the throne of David here, what we have is that there are people that are not invited to his dinner. Amen. Praise God. So that's a good thing, that they're not invited. It's very important for us as I begin to, to get into this message tonight to be careful about who we hang with. And if you're not a part of a rebellion or a coup d'etat against the kingdom of God, you're never going to be invited by people who are involved in that kind of overthrow. If you're invited by people who are trying to overthrow the kingdom of God, you better check your walk. Because people who are, who are involved in trying to overthrow the kingdom of God and the work of God, they know if you are with them or you're not with them. And if you're not with them, they're not going to send out an invitation to you to come and join them in that rebellion because they know your position. So it's very important that you are very careful to understand Christian uh, mercy and all of that. I understand the desire to try to help people, but there are certain people uh, that have been involved in rebellion against the kingdom of God. You want to stay clear of them because they, whether you realize it or not, that spirit that they carry will get on you. So we see some men, Nathan the prophet, we see mighty men, we see Solomon. None of them were invited to this coup d'etat. None of them. Why? Because they know that they're not going to be with them, that they are with King David, right? Okay. So we see then that there are some, though, leaders, Joab, Abiathar, the priest, etc., some leaders that are against Solomon. So they're involved in this coup d'etat. I'm just giving you the background before we get into the message. But the Lord is Yahweh is what his name means. Now, he didn't live up to his name. So what we have is we have a plan of Nathan and Bathsheba here to make sure that Solomon ascends to the throne. I'm not going to get into all the details here, but you can read that beginning in verse 11. And uh, beginning in verse 33, at this point, Adonijah is only ruling for a few weeks in this coup d'etat. Amen. All right. And this is, when is this happening? This is happening when David is down. Number one. Number two, maybe Adonijah feels like that he's got a right to overthrow David's will because of David's past failure. Okay, you see how that works? Okay. So what happens here is, long story short, the 
knowledge that Adonijah is usurping the throne comes to David. And then David, uh, verse 32, tells him what to do. Okay. King David said, Call me Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. And they came before the king. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord and call Solomon my, my son, say Solomon, my son, to ride upon my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him. This is the uh, anointing, praise God, from God. So he's chosen by God. He's anointed by God to be the next king. Whereas Adonijah has no anointing. He's a self-appointed man. Okay, amen? Um, Bible tells us here again, verse 34, And let Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, anoint him their king over Israel, and blow ye with the trumpet... And say, God save King Solomon. So when the trumpet is sounded, something is going to be revealed. Amen. When the trumpet is sounded, things are going to change. Now prophetically, this has a prophetic significance of a false Messiah. Who's going to come into the world and is seek to usurp the authority of God. The trumpet's going to be sounded and a revelation of Jesus is going to come. And when that trumpet sounds, there's going to be a major change in the world. Now, I'm saying that because Sunday morning I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you, preach to you about the New World Order. And I'm going to show you things that you've never seen before about the New World Order and where we are right now in time. We are much closer to the coming of the Lord than most people realize. All right? So I'm already prepared to bring that message to you. So there's going to be a false Messiah, a false, uh, the Antichrist that's going to come. He's a picture, uh, he's pictured here by Adonijah who's seeking to usurp the throne of Jesus Christ. But when the trumpet is sounded, there's going to be a revelation of Jesus, and that Antichrist spirit is going to be overthrown, and everybody that's a part of his kingdom. But that's the prophetic aspect of it, okay? And that's the deeper, and, and that's really very important for us to see. Uh, so we see that Solomon is going to be anointed. We see the trumpet's going to sound, and then they're going to say what? God saved the king. Save King Solomon. Again, this is the instruction from David. Uh, then you shall come up after him that he may come and sit upon my throne. For he shall be king in my stead. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over all Judah. And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king and said, Amen. The Lord God of my Lord the king say so too. As the Lord had been with my Lord the king, even so be he with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. So what we see, this is actually going to come to pass. So Solomon's going to mount up on a mule. He's going to come in peace. Very important. He's coming in peace. He's riding on a throne, not a, a mule, not a war horse. Verse 38. Verse 39. Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle, anointed Solomon, and they blew the trumpet. So this is the second time he's anointed. They blew the trumpet, and all the people said, God save King Solomon. And all the people came up after him, and people played and flutes and rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth split with the sound of them. Great rejoicing at, at the crowning of Solomon. Amen? Now, Adonijah is going to get information about that his coup d'etat, his overthrow, is not working. Amen? So when he hears that, what is he going to do? Here's all this noise of people being excited that Solomon's uh, going to be king. And he hears about that king, uh, that Solomon's been made king. He doesn't know what the noise is all about, right? And so we have then the information comes to him, verse 43, that David has made Solomon the king. Right? Amen. Verse 45, And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet hath anointed him king in Gihon, and they are come up from their rejoicing so that the city rang again. This is the noise that you have heard. And as Solomon sitteth on the throne of, and also Solomon sitteth on the throne of the kingdom, and moreover the king's servants came to bless our Lord King David, saying, God make the name of Solomon better than thy name, make his throne greater than thy throne. And the king bowed himself upon the bed. 
And also thus saith the king, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath given one to sit on my throne this day, mine eyes even seeing it. All the guests who were with Adonijah were afraid, and rose up and went every man his way. So his coup d'etat, his overthrow is not working. Now what does Adonijah do? Again, what does his name mean? The Lord is Yahweh. What does he do? In the time of coup d'etat, he's the one that tried to overthrow the, the will of God and the government of God. He has been uncovered. He's been revealed. It didn't work. Solomon's sitting on the throne. So he is afraid. What does he do? The Bible said Adonijah feared because of Solomon and arose and went and caught hold of the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon. For lo, he hath caught hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me this today, that he will not slay his servant with the sword. So in the time of the coup d'etat, in the time where this individual is trying to overthrow the government, and it's by violence, when he is uncovered and he's revealed, what does he do in the time of coup d'etat? He runs to a place. Now, you're going to see over and over, as I read this story, I saw something jump out over and over and over. Throughout the text, uh, different men are going to be told, go to your house. They're going to be told, go to Jerusalem and build a house. We're going to find another man is slain and buried in his house in the wilderness. So over and over in the text here, we're going to see dwelling places of people in a time of coup d'etat. Okay? So he runs, then Adonijah runs to the temple of God. He grabs hold of the horns of the altar. Four horns on that altar speak of strength, salvation, security, power. It's ultimately the protection of God. So he's going to the right place. So he has a, maybe a little bit, he's got fear, we know that. Maybe a little bit of repentance towards what he's done in his rebellion. Right? Right? Because we see that Solomon, because he goes to that place that he grabs a hold of the horns of the altar, the place of refuge, Solomon says, okay, you're not going to die. So Solomon shows mercy to this self-exalted usurper over his uh, uh, anointing, over his kingship. Is everybody with me? So let's look at it so I don't lose you. And Solomon said in verse 52, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not a hair of him fall to the earth, but if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall what? He shall die. So we see this man is going to be given mercy. But he is told by Solomon that he has to stay in a specific place. Do you understand? So mercy is going to be given to him, but he's got to stay in the place of mercy. And his submission is going to be tested. So Solomon tells him, all right, you're not going to die. Mercy is going to be showed to you, but you're going to have to stay in your house. And if you come out of that dwelling place, you're going to be slain. Because you have been given an opportunity to experience the mercy of God in your life. But we're going to test whether or not you're submissive to him or not. So that submission is going to be tested. And so we see here the Bible says, Solomon said in verse 52, If he will show himself worthy, a worthy man, there shall not a hair of him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall what? He shall die. Now, mercy has come to this man because he's gone to the temple. He's gone to the dwelling place. And he's grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar, the sanctuary. And so, okay, Solomon said, all right, I'm going to show mercy to this individual. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. So it is important to understand that when you are walking with the Lord, that you are a person of mercy. So Solomon shows him mercy, but he says, verse 53, so King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. And he came and bowed himself to King Solomon. And watch this. And Solomon said unto him, Go to thine own house. 
That's a key. So he has been showed grace. He's been showed mercy in his life. And all he's got to do is go home and stay at home. But is he going to do that? Is he going to stay in his place? Amen? He's not going to do it, and we're going to see it in a minute. So he has experienced mercy. How many of y'all have experienced mercy? It is important for you and I to stay in the place of mercy. Amen. Praise God. Now, I would say this as I read this story here. Um, you know, Solomon wants to show mercy. And the man's somewhat repentant. But when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. I'm going to say it again. When somebody shows you who they are over a period of time, believe them. Because if you don't, you're going to end up being the one that's hurt. So Adonijah, he, you know, he's got this record and uh, he's trying to overthrow the government of coup d'etat. And Solomon says, okay, I'm willing to show you mercy right now, but I'm going to test your submission. I'm going to test to see whether or not you're really changed or not. Do you appreciate the mercy of God in your life? Do you appreciate the grace of God that has been shown you or not? And if you don't appreciate that, you're not going to stay in your place. You get that point. So God is merciful to us, but he will test us to see whether or not we're submissive or not. Praise the Lord. And so he says, go to thine house. Say with me, a test of submission. Attest to the submission of God's authority. Right? First dwelling place in a coup d'etat was that he was to go to his own house and reside there. Now, the Bible says in chapter 2, the days of David drew near that he should die. He charged Solomon, Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways to keep his statutes and his commandments and his ordinances and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper all that thou doest and wherever thou turnest thyself. Right? So he's, David's speaking to die. He said, all right, you're going to go to the throne, but you need to follow righteousness. You need to follow the commandments of God. So another beatitude comes to mind. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? feel so he's telling him to hunger and thirst for righteousness and to walk in that place dwell in that obedience to God and keep his commandments if he does God said you're going to bless his life all right so he is on the throne now verse 5 we got another individual it's not just Adonijah but Joab was involved in the coup d'etat the overthrow of the government Adonijah has been showed mercy. He's supposed to dwell in his house. Joab, the chief general of David, was involved in that coup d'etat. What's going to happen to him? So we see here David is going to say something. He says in verse 5, Moreover thou knowest also what Joab the son of Zeruah did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, and to Abner the son of Ner, and to Amos the son of Jether, whom he slew and shed the blood of war and peace and put the blood of war upon his belt that was about his loins and in his shoes uh, that were on his feet. Now what is, what is David saying? Okay. David is saying that this man did him harm. But what is interesting, the life of David, even though he experienced a lot of problems from Joab, Joab was his chief general, but he's one of the most carnal men in the Bible. And how in the world you know that this man continued to be a general in the, over the armies of God is beyond me because he is so carnal. Are you understanding this? And he did David a lot of harm. But David, while he was alive, you with me? Before he gets to the point of death, he doesn't do anything against Joab. Why is that? Because if David, while he's alive and strong... If he vindicates what Joab has done, he's going to appear before the people as vindictive. And he can't take the chance of, of trying to, you know, bring a judgment against Joab while he's alive because it'll look bad on him. So David waits to the end of his life. 
And he says, now's the time. Joab must pay. And obviously, if the man's fixing to die, nobody can say that this is because he's just vindictive. So he's protecting himself from maybe an opinion that the people might have. Is everybody with me here? Okay. So he's let Joab do his thing for years and years and years. And Joab's uh, did he, done many hurtful things. Uh, he became a hitman on his own. And he killed a couple of innocent individuals. So David looks at Solomon and he says, Joab must be killed for that. Again, at the time of his death, not at the time way back when he had strength. Because he doesn't want to appear as somebody that's vindictive. It's not about vindict- being vindictive. It's about things that are being made right. Okay? Do you understand that? This man deserves what he's going to get. But David waited for that uh, at the appropriate time. Amen? Okay, so we see what happens then in verse 5. Uh, David commands Solomon to kill Joab. Uh, verse 6, do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. But show kindness unto the sons of Barzila, Barzila, the Gileadite, let them be of those who eat at thy table. For so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom my brother. Amen. And then he comes to the next person. His name is Shimei. And I, I pronounce it Shimei. Y'all remember Shimei, right? He's the one that cursed David when Absalom rose up in a rebellion against David. And David left, you know, Jerusalem. He got out of town so he wouldn't have to fight his own son. You know? And when he did, Shimei went out and began to curse David. At that time, David did not know whether or not that was from God or not. And, and those that were with him, with King David at that time of the rebellion of Absalom, they were ready to take this man's head off. You know, because he's coming out, he's kicking stones at David, and he's cursing David and everything else. And so uh, those that are with David said, let us take his head off. Let's kill him right now. They said, said no, you leave him alone. He said, because I don't know, this may be from God. God may have sent this man as a judgment against me, so just leave him alone. He, David was not sure if that was from God or not, okay? There's some things you don't know if they're going to be from God or not. But you just put yourself in the hands of God. You say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you with this. And if I don't like the outcome, I don't like what's going on right now, I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get nasty because this could be from the Lord. Everybody with me, do you understand that? Now, even a world leader knows that. There's a, a woman by the name of Angela Merkel. She is the chancellor, chancellor of the United Germany right now. And it won't be too much longer until she, she stops being a chancellor. She's going to eventually retire. But one of her statements was this. And she lived before Germany was united. She lived on the side that was oppressive. Not the free side, but the side that was oppressive. And this wall was dividing Germany, East and West Germany. And when she was little, she would walk up to that wall desiring to be on the other side. But she couldn't get on the other side. And uh, with time, of course, the wall came down and united Germany. And she became the ruler uh, over uh, united Germany. But this woman said something very interesting. She said, do not become bitter in life. Do not become nasty in life. She said, when people do you wrong, you lift up your head and you keep, you know what I'm saying? Very important, brother and sister, because there's going to be times in your life that things are going to come to you and they're going to be hurtful and going to be painful. But you can't get nasty and you can't get bitter and you can't let life turn you into monster. Amen. I would say it this way. Lift up your head to God. You know, walk with the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. So David never allowed himself to get bitter. He didn't understand maybe what was going on at times, but he just left it in the hands of God when Shimei's cursing him, kicking rocks at him, etc. You know the story, right? Well, whatever happened to that man? David let him live. And so the Bible says, And behold, uh, thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a B- uh, Bahurim, who cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him 
by the Lord saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. So Shimei comes to David. He humbles himself before David. And David says, okay, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to put you. He gave an oath to that man. He made a promise to that man that he would not kill him. Right? So he's telling Solomon this, that he made an oath to show mercy to Shimei or to Shimei. Verse 9, therefore, hold not now, hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him, but his gray head, but his gray head uh, bring thou down to Sheol with the blood. Now evidently David knows something about this man. Even though he promised him that he would not kill him, he says to his son, you're going to have to take care of business with this man. He knows what kind of man he is. Now, mercy is going to be showed to Shimei, though, by Solomon because of the oath his father David made to him. Watch this. Okay, we're going to see it. We're getting there. So anyway, to make a long story short, David dies. Solomon ascends to the throne. Verse 13, let's go back to Adonijah. Adonijah showed mercy. Wow, he should have stayed in that mercy. Amen? He should have stayed in that place. He could have been slain instantly, but he wasn't. One, one thing was commanded him, stay in your house in that dwelling place of mercy. So here he comes, verse 13. He does not fulfill the test of submission. So Adonijah, the son of Haggath, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, Comest thou peacefully? He said, Peacefully. So already he has disobeyed. Already he is failing the test of submission. Grace has been shown to him. Mercy has been shown to him. Uh, but he's, he's going to, you know, he's just self-willed. And his heart, you know, is something wrong with his heart. So he doesn't obey what was told him. And he didn't stay in that place of grace. And he goes over to Bathsheba, his mother, and he says, Hey, you know, at one time the kingdom belonged to me. And people were with me in that coup d'etat, Ma, you know that. And that kingdom belonged to me. But ultimately it came to Solomon and he said, I know it was the Lord that did that. But he said, I have one request. One request, Bathsheba. One request, Mama. I want Abishag the Shunammite. I want to get married to her. And would you go to King Solomon and ask my brother if it's okay if I get married to Abishag, the Shunammite? Well, see, he has already left the place of mercy. He, has, he had specific directions from God, not just Solomon, but from God to stay in that place of grace and mercy. But he did and so what Bathsheba does, she goes to Solomon, and Solomon hears her speak. Uh, verse 20. Then she said, I desire one small petition of thee. I pray thee, refuse me not. And the king said to her, ask on my mother, for I will not refuse thee. And she said, let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah thy brother in marriage. So what is Solomon's response? King Solomon answered and said unto his mother, And why dost thou ask Abishag, the Shunammite, for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also. For he is my elder brother, even for him, and for Ab Abiathar the priest, and for Joab the son of Zeruah. He's asking for the hand of Abishag. He's left his dwelling place in a time of d'etat, the place of mercy. He has rebelled against God. He is not faithful to the test of submission. And so now he's asking for the hand of Abishag, and Solomon sees right through him. He doesn't just want the hand of Abishag. He wants the kingdom still. It's still in his heart, that overthrow. Even though he's not anointed, he's not chosen by God to replace David, he's still got that coup d'etat in his heart. And Solomon recognizes that he's still the same old Adonijah that has always been. And so the Bible said, Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God so, do so to me, and more also if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. Now therefore, as the Lord liveth, 
who hath established me and set me on the throne of David my father, who hath made me in a house as he promised. Adonijah shall be put to death. And King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he fell upon him that he died. So Yahweh, the Lord is Yahweh, has now become Adonijah's God of judgment. Okay, because he did not stay in that house. He did not remain in the place of mercy. He stepped out of that and he is slain now. So that, that's the removal of the coup d'etat number one. Okay? The usurper, self-exalted person, not anointed. Now we come to Abiathar. Abiathar was, at some point, he was faithful to David. He walked with David. Uh, amen. He joined himself with David. But he, somehow he got caught up in that rebellion. He got caught up in that coup d'etat, if you will, that Adonijah seeking to overthrow the government. Bad choice. Bad decision. Amen. That's why I say very important that you understand how careful it is. Be careful who you hang with. Very important. Because the fact that he got caught up in that rebellion and that usurping of the authority of God. We're going to see what happens to this man and he's a preacher. He's not just your regular Joe. He is a preacher. And he gave himself to a coup d'etat or an overthrow of God's purpose in the kingdom of God. And as a result of that, you would think, well, God, surely God will show him favoritism and let him keep being a preacher. But watch what, what, watch what happens. Because he got caught up in that crowd and that overthrow. And he's running with the wrong people. He is removed from the ministry. God doesn't take these things lightly. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So Abiathar the priest said, uh, the king, get thee to where? Anathoth. Unto thine own fields. So now we have another dwelling place in an overthrow effort. And that's Anathoth. And what is interesting, I went and I looked up the word Anathoth. But Anathoth in the uh, concordance is not defined. But it will send you up and it will give you the number in the concordance, Strong's concordance, and it gives you the root word, it's Anna. Okay? So the root word Anna from Anathoth, Anathoth is a plural form of Anna. Now Anna, if you think Anna the way you spell it, you know the name Anna, that means grace. But the term Anna... Anna thought the plural form of Anna literally means a place of humility. Are you understanding? So here we have again a test of whether or not this individual who's in, who was involved in the overthrow of the will of God and the kingdom of God, he is going to be sent to a place where he can humble himself and show that his heart is submissive to the will of God. Anna thought. So Anna... That means to humble themselves. So as long as he strays in this place, Anathoth at his fields, and he walks humbly, everything's going to be all right. The only thing is he's going to be removed from the ministry, but he gets to stay alive as long as he keeps dwelling in the place of humility. Amen? So we see uh, Solomon says, Get thee to Anathoth under thine own, own fields. For thou art worthy of what? Death. Now, Abiathar means father of abundance. The problem is all of these people are forgetting what their name means. Adonijah forgets that Yahweh is the Lord. This man forgets that God is the father of abundance. And so what we have here is that he could have been put to death, but again, mercy is shown to this man as long as he stays in the place of humility. He dwells in the place of humility. Now, it's also interesting this word has another definition to it. It means to see or pay attention. Now, this, you know, as I preach this, you might be wondering why I'm preaching it, okay? But we need to understand the importance of dwelling in a place of mercy. We need to understand the importance of dwelling in a place of humility 
understanding how to walk in submission to God's will and purpose in our lives. Praise God. So we see, he says, you pay attention, Anna. And what is he paying attention to? Being humble. Okay. Praise the Lord. Because thou hast been afflicted in all in which my father was afflicted, so Solomon thrust out Abi Athar from being priest unto the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord which he spoke concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. <clears throat> so the Spirit of God this afternoon emphasized to me the Sermon on the Mount. And Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Adonijah showed mercy until he rebels. Then we see David telling Solomon to walk in the commandments of the Lord. Again, another beatitude. We are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We shall be filled. Now we see in, in the context of this statement concerning Abiathar, he is to go to a place of humility. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. For they shall obtain, they shall obtain what? The earth. Very powerful things here. These are the things that we should walk in. So Adonijah has been slain. Abiathar has been removed from the ministry because they were part of the coup d'etat. But each one of them had a dwelling place that they could go to even in that rebellion. See, in judgment, God remembers mercy. So we have these places that God has given to us that we can go to and we can find uh, uh, mercy from God and grace from God and we need to learn to walk humbly before the Lord. Amen? Now, if God brings judgment in our life, He removes somebody from the ministry, you know, the wrong approach to that is to get prideful and lift it up and, you know, get an attitude about that and say, no, Lord, I'm going to stay humble. I'm going to stay in Anathoth. I'm going to dwell in this place. Because I want to be saved. The good news, Abiathar stayed there. Now we come to Joab. Now Joab is going to be slain. Verse 28. Then tidings came to Joab for Joab had turned from Adonijah, though he turned not after Absalom. And Joab fled into the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold of the horns of the altar. So again, now we have another man that's involved in the coup d'etat. And he's going to run for his life to the tabernacle of the Lord. He catches hold on the horns of the altar just like Adonijah did. But he's not repentant. All he wants is, you know, he wants a place where he can, he, his life can be spared. And because he was a hit man and he took it upon himself to destroy innocent blood, God said, you're going to die for that. You understand what I'm telling you? God is not looking for hit men in the church. Amen? Number one, he's not going to be your hit man because somebody's doing something that you don't like. And if you go to God, you say, okay, God, I don't like this. I need you to be my hit man. I'm going to tell you something. That's rebellion. God is not going to be your hit man. Against somebody in the church. And number two, God's not going to call you to be a hitman to anybody. So if you become a hitman in the body of Christ and you get out of your place, you got bad things coming your way. You understand what I'm telling you? Amen. You'd be surprised how many people have this vengeance in their heart and they want God to be their own personal hitman. He's not that kind of a God. Amen. And he hadn't assigned me or he hadn't assigned you to be a hitman to anybody. Amen. And so this is why he's going to be slain. It was told King Solomon that Joab fled in the tabernacle of the Lord, and behold, he is by the altar. And then Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, saying, Go fall upon him. And Benaiah came to the tabernacle of the Lord and said unto him, Thus saith the king, Come forth. And he said, No, but I will die here. And Benaiah brought the king word again, saying, Thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. Well, right off we find out where his spirit is because the king calls for him. And he said, No, I'm not coming. 
Okay? Verse 31, the king said unto him, Do as he has said, and fall upon him, and bury him, that thou mayest take away the innocent blood which Joab shed from me and from the house of my father. Now who did he slay? We've already read who he slew in verse 5. It was Abner. And what happened? Why was Abner slain? He was in the city of refuge. He had run for his life to the city of refuge. And he could not be slain in the city of refuge as long as he dwelled in that place. But when watch what happens. He gets tricked to come out of the city of protection. And when Abner steps out, he's killed. The knife plunged under his rib. And he's slain, but he's slain as an innocent man. Because if he had stayed in the city of refuge, he would have been protected. But because he listened to the enemy. And the enemy tricked him out of getting, you with me? Tricked him out of staying in the city of refuge. When you step out of the place of God's protection and God's dwelling place, the enemy wants to kill you as soon as you step out. And so Abner is slain. Why is he slain? Because he did not stay in his place. The emphasis today is to stay in your place. Are you understanding, brothers and sisters? Put Jesus on the throne of your heart and don't ever take him off the throne of your heart and you stay in a place of mercy. You stay in a place of submission. You stay in a place of humility. You don't become a hit man in the church. You trust God to take care of things because God will not tolerate somebody who tries to become a hit man in the church. And the king said unto him, Do as he has said, and fall upon him, and bury him, that thou mayest take away the innocent blood which Joab shed from me and from the house of my father. Amen? And the Lord shall return his blood upon his own head, who fell upon two men more righteous and better than he. See, for some reason, when he looked at Abner and he looked at the other person, he looked at them as not being as righteous or holy as he was. So, therefore, he felt like he, you know, he could do this and that God would be on his side. God said, oh, no, 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 they were better than you. And as a result of that, he's fixing to die. Even though he's got a hold of the horns of the altar, even though he's at church, he's fixed to be slain in the house of God. Amen. Because he has shed innocent blood. Two men more righteous and better than he. And slew them with a sword. My father David not knowing it. Abner the son of Ner. Captain of the host of Israel. And Amasa the son of Jethro. Captain of the host of Judah. Now I want you to think about that. That's heavy. What made him think that he was God's hit man? Or that he, was, he should, you know, that he had a right to do this. He had a spirit that wasn't right. He had a nasty spirit. Wow. And God looked at him and said, all right, they were better than you are. But you took it upon yourself to kill them. To be a hit man. Verse 33, their, their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his seed. Forever, but upon David and upon his seed and upon his house and upon his throne shall there be peace forever from the Lord. So Benaiah the son of Jehoiada went up and fell upon him and slew him and he was buried, watch this, in his own house in the wilderness. Everything that we see here is connected to a dwelling place. And because Joab he wasn't right in his heart, and we know the story. I've already preached it to you. He is slain, and he's buried in his own house. Where? In a wilderness. Amen? So now we have all of these people that are involved in that coup d'etat. Adonijah, who tried to usurp the throne of God without being anointed, tried to position himself to take the place of David, not in the will of God, given mercy and grace as long as he dwelt in his home, but he does not... Passed the test of submission. 
He comes out, and so he's slain. Abiathar is removed from the ministry because of his part in the coup d'etat. He is sent to Anathoth, which is the place of humility. He loses the ministry, but he can still remain alive as long as he continues to be humble. Joab is slain because he assigned to himself to be a hitman over somebody that was more righteous than him. You get the point. But all of those people were involved in a coup d'etat. Now, when is this happening? It happens before the temple can be built. And I will tell you, church, right now from the Holy Ghost, okay? And I'm not judging you. I'm just saying to you as a church, this church will never see revival until we get our hearts right with God. Amen? Amen. Pastor, saints, whoever, we have got to get our hearts right with God. Because if we're walking in rebellion, we're usurping authority, we're out of our place. Amen. If, if your pastor's not right with you, the church, if the church is not right with its pastor, this church will never see revival. Because the temple cannot be built in that kind of atmosphere. Revival will never come to a church if the pastor is not treating the people the way he should. And if the church is not right with their pastor, that church will never see revival. We have got to get ourselves in the right, right place in God. Amen. Because if we don't, we're never going to grow. Every one of these, watch this, this is internal rebellion. This is not external rebellion. This is a coup d'etat. This is an overthrow from within the church, within the house. And God is saying, I've got to get rid of all of that out of the kingdom before the temple can be built. You and I, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you the Holy Ghost right now that we need to look at our lives and we need to examine ourselves. Are we running with people that can bring the judgments of God upon our lives? Or is our heart right with God? Is my heart right with God? Is your heart right with God? Is my heart right with you? Is your heart right with each other? Is your heart right with your pastor? If it's not, brothers and sisters... And we're doing things in secret. David said these things happened when he didn't even know about it. What David did, he did it. They, David said he did this. Joab did it when I didn't even know about it. And there are things I'm telling you as your pastor that go, go on behind your pastor's back. I don't have a vengeance. I'm not vindictive tonight. I'm not judging you tonight. I'm just telling you that stuff has got to stop. Because even in the kingdom of God, God can't bring revival to a church or his purpose, the temple, without that internal rebellion being removed out of our hearts. Brother, sister, we got to get it right. And I say in the Holy Ghost, we got to get it right right now. And we got to get in our place. We got to get in our, where we should be. Hallelujah. Praise God. We can't be sitting around the table at home and eating and chewing our brothers and sisters up and killing our brothers and sisters. We can't be sitting at the tables and talking about the pastor and all of that, you know. That, uh, you can't keep doing that and expect to have revival. You can't be doing stuff behind the back of the pastor. Amen? And expect to have the favor of God in your life. And you know what I mean, doing stuff behind the back of the pastor. You know what I'm talking about. So the Holy Ghost is speaking to us tonight. We've got to get in our place. Because the enemy's desire is to seek to raise up a coup d'etat. To overthrow God's government and kingdom. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost. He started it years ago. I mean we first started this church. He tried to do it when we first started this church. And he's tried to do it throughout the years. But guess what? By the grace of God. We're still here and you're here. But God is saying mercy will be shown to us and grace will be shown to us. But we've got to get in our place. And when God tests our submission, we have to say, yes, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. So I don't have anything against anybody tonight. I, I don't. But I'm talking about the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you something, brother. Sister, there's nothing can stop this church from having revival. If we get our spirits right, if we get our hearts right, if we dwell where we're supposed to be, if we get in our place, 
God, tonight, let all of us get in our place. Let husbands get in their place. Let wives get in their place. Let children get in their place. Because if we don't get in the place, the temple can't be built. Amen. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, in the Holy Ghost, I believe he's tweaking some things. I don't think we got a huge major issue here. But he's going to tweak some things. Are you understanding this, brothers and sisters? Praise the Lord. Amen. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. God wants to bless us in his kingdom. That's what, a, you know, beatitude means to be blessed. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless this church. But he can't do it if you're not in the place of mercy. If you're not in the place where you should be in your heart and in your spirit. And I know you may look at the situation and say, well, I have a right to have this attitude. That's what they thought. That's what Adonijah thought. That's why he started the coup d'etat. And when Joab steps up there, yeah, I'll back you, Adonijah. Yeah, I'll back you, you know. And then Abiathar, the priest, he shows up. I'll back this coup d'etat, this overthrow. God said, I'm going to judge them all. But I'm going to give them space to repent. I'm going to give them space to get right. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Now watch. What is going to happen to Shimei? Now listen to me. When I preach, I'm preaching you the truth. Okay? Listen. We can all have a difference of opinion. But we can't have different facts. Facts are facts. So when I preach this, look at yourself in the mirror. Don't sit there and think, well, brother, brother, that's brother, that's sister, so-and-so. No, you look in the mirror yourself and you say, that's the spirit I've been walking in. And I need to get it right. You know, we always, you know we're real good about that, aren't we? Sometimes we like to pitch it over to somebody else. No, it's me, oh God. It's me, oh God. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me, oh God. I got to get in my place, Lord. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And yes, that means you're going to have to make some decisions. You are. You know that spirit just going to go away? No, man, it is going to come. It's going to try to pick this one off and pick that one off. And You know, God is here today not to judge you. God's here to help you. To keep you from being picked off in this, in the mess. You know, I tell people, you know, you t- see, I recently watched, in their own words, on PBS, uh, Angela Merkel's story. And it's really amazing, okay? Some of the decisions that she makes is in relationship to Christianity. I don't know if you know that or not, but she makes decisions based on the Bible, okay? And she is very careful because she's, she understands communism, you know? And uh, now it's a free state. She's trying to govern Germany like a democracy. People have freedom, you know. And uh, she's the first leader of a united, a united Germany, a free Germany. Okay? And it's the largest growing nation in the world for refugees to come. And she, she opens the borders because of this Bible. But something that I caught was very interesting. She has very few people that she lets get close to her. And because of that, in all the years that she's been the chancellor of the United Germany, there has never been a leak. There's never been a leak. There's never been a mole. There's never been in there anybody in there that has betrayed her. 
package. And, and you understand? Not one time. Because she was so careful in who she let get around her. Very few people are close to Angela Merkel. Because she knows the danger of letting too many people get close to her. And I have told people over and over in this church, especially if you're a leader, you have got to be careful about how you, who you let have access to you. And it's not about me. You have to understand a spiritual principle. You can't open your door to everybody. And I know I, we want to be Christians and we want to be kind and loving and all of that. But there's some people, no, I'm not giving you access. You have to be careful about who you let in your world, especially if you're a leader. So she's very careful. There's only a few people that are really, really, that she lets really be really close to her, okay? Amen. And I thought it was amazing. Not in the whole history of her chancellorship, in the whole history, not one leak, not one coup d'etat. You, you, you know how hard that would be if you're a political leader like she is? To try, to try to keep things from leaking out here and, you know, and a, and a big old scandal breaking out and all this stuff, right? Hey, man, this country is constantly going through leaks here and leaks here about the government. You understand? You understand what I'm telling you? So what God shows us is we have to be careful about who we let get close to us. You, I'm saying that for your good. I'm saying that for your good. And if you open the doors to people that you're not supposed to be running with, you are in big trouble. Ultimately, because God has not put his favor on that. Amen? So if you're a leader tonight, I'm going to tell you, be careful. Be careful with what you say. Be careful with what you do. Be careful with your words. Micah 7 says... You know, don't even talk to the one that's sleeping beside you. Are you understanding? Jesus said this, what's, what's spoken in secret shall be shouted on the housetops. And I don't know if you know it, brothers and sisters, but that little phone that you and I carry around on our sides every day is on constantly. It's never off. And whether you realize it or not, everything you say and everything you do is being picked up. You are in an age of omnivalence right now. Omni, omni means, you know, like omnipresent means everywhere present. Omnipotence, all-powerful. Omniscient, all-knowing. You're in an age of omnivalence. You are being monitored and surveyed, and you're in surveillance constantly. Every moment you got that phone, Siri is hearing what you're talking about. What's gonna, what is said in secret shall be shouted on the mountaintops. And that's why I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you have to be careful about what you say right now, who you run with, because it's going to be shouted on the mountaintops. Say praise the Lord. And especially if you wear this little watch around your wrist. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to cell phones. I have one. I'm just telling you, you're being surveilled, you know, under surveillance. And that watch, what do they call that watch? Apple watch. That's even more. I mean, it's connected to you. It literally makes you more than just a human being. Okay? Crazy stuff going on right now. I said crazy stuff going on right now. So be careful. Again, who you let get close to you. Be careful about what you're talking about. Be careful about what you're doing. Because whether you realize it or not, information is being gathered on you constantly. Just waiting for the moment to come out. 
my daughter not long ago, she noticed something when she was in town with us. She noticed she was talking about a particular kind of backpack and just talking about it, right? And then all of a sudden, and I'm not kidding you, it came up on my computer. It came up on hers. And we started talking about that. I said, did you go on the computer and look for that backpack? She said, no. But Siri heard her. And that information that she heard us talking about was sent to people that sell that bag. And it popped up on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Now, you might be worried about this phone listening in on your every conversation and knowing exactly what you're doing all the time. But I got news for you. God is the one that has true. He's the true omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnivalence. He knows every. He doesn't even know, not just what we say, but he knows our thoughts. And that's why I can, I can stand up here and I can preach the Word of God tonight and bring an application to you without even, you know, nobody coming and say, Hey, Pastor, there's something going on here. Nobody has to tell me that because the Spirit of God is omnivalence. He knows people's hearts. He knows their thoughts. He knows everything. Hallelujah. <coughs> so, you know, beware. Look at your say, beware. Look at your neighbor, tell him, say, beware. Watch out. Yeah. <laughs> I think I got one sister in the church. She didn't even bring her cell phone to church. Because she knows, she knows that. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Okay. So we have to be careful right now to stay in our place. Be careful who you hang with. Be careful with what you say. Don't just let anything come out of your mouth. Just because you think it doesn't mean you should say it. Because at some point, it could be used against you. Everybody awake? You are being tracked. That's right. You know? What you, you know, you Facebook this one and Facebook that one and all the communications that you have with everybody on Facebook and all that. That's all. It's being recorded. There's a record of it. And it's just waiting to come out. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. I love y'all. See, because Joab got caught up in that, he had his own problems. Abiathar got caught up in that cootie tall. You right? God said, no, I can't have that if I'm going to build my kingdom. I can't have that kind of working and undermining and, and self-exaltation. And, you know, and I don't have a problem with ambition, but it better be sanctified ambition. Because if it's not sanctified and it's not according to the will of God, you'll be trying to usurp and put yourself in places that you're not ready for. And I'm not mad at anybody tonight, brothers and sisters. I love y'all. I'm just preaching what God is telling me to preach. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. I, I, want, I want to stay in my place. I want my heart to be right. And I thank God for mercy. I thank God for grace. It's been showed to me. And I want God to show it to, you know, and he does. I don't have to want it. He, he does. Show mercy to all of us. Praise the Lord. Ultimately, it's about the growing of the kingdom. Oh, if, if, listen, if you're here and you're here for any other reason, then you personally being saved, your family being saved, you growing in God and seeing the kingdom of God grow, if you're here for selfish ambition, this is not the place you want to be. Because this is God's kingdom. It's not mine. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. So, again, I'm not mad at anybody. Just bringing the word of God to you. Now, what's going to happen to Shimei? Shimei, he wasn't really, as far as I could tell, a part of the coup d'etat. 
But he's brought up in, you know, in this picture here with David because of his cursing and, you know, cursing David and man, 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 man. You get it. Right? Brother and sister, let me tell you something. David failed, but he was still anointed by God. And it wasn't that man's place to kick any rocks. And it wasn't his place to curse anybody with his tongue. You understanding? And David made an oath to him. said, all right. He said, I'm not going to kill you. You know, you've come to me. and I'm going to show you mercy. I'm going to show you grace. So Solomon then is told by David that, you know, ultimately you're going to have to kill him too. Because David knows his heart. But because of the oath, God says, watch this, through David. I'm going to let him live. But he has to stay in a certain place. There's a dwelling place in the midst of a coup d'etat. And so he looks and we see this in the Bible in verse 36. And the king sent and called for a Shimei and said unto him, Build thee a house in Jerusalem. You build a house in the city of peace. And you dwell there. You stay there. Do you see the picture? Every one of these people are told to stay in their place. And if they do, they'll be all right. Even though they have internal rebellion against the kingdom. Now, verse 36, and the king sent and called for Shimei and said unto him, Build thee a house in where? Jerusalem, the city of peace. And dwell there and go not forth from there anywhere. Don't leave it. You get in that place of peace and you stay there. You don't get out of your place. For it shall be that on the day that thou goest out, you leave. Jerusalem, and you're going to die. You get out of that place, you're dwelling, and you're going to die. It's going to kill you. You understand? It's going to kill you. It's just as plain as day. There's no mystery about it. There's a science to God's judgment. It's not a mystery. And also, there's a science to His blessing. If you want blessings, it's not a mystery. If you want an A by F or life, if you want a life of abundance, there's no mystery to that. That is obeying God's word when he speaks to you, when he tells you to get in your place, when he tells you what to do. You better do it because if you don't, there will be no blessing in your own self-will. And you're going to say, well, I can't figure it out. It just never works for me. I think we need to look at our life because God wants to give you an abundance of life. Amen. All you got to do, Shemai, is stay in the city of peace. Just stay in your place. That's it. That's all that's required of you. Amen. You stay in that place. He didn't say you need to bring a bunch of money and pay this. He didn't. No, he said you stay in your place. For it shall be that on the day that thou what? Goest out. You leave, you're a dead man. Again, there's no mystery to this. If we stay in our place, if we walk in mercy, if we walk in grace, if we walk in humility, if we have a submissive spirit, amen, then God will bless your life. And you'll be saved. When we start messing around with stuff that we shouldn't mess around with, we're signing death warrant. It's a spiritual kingdom. God's God's got his eye. It's omnivalence, but it's the Lord. (laughs) He's the one you want to please. I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please God, you know, and I'm not trying to displease you. (laughs) But ultimately, do we please God tonight? Do I please God tonight with my words, with my actions, with my attitudes? heavy man you know and and I promise you what God wants to do he wants to 
bring you back and put you in your place. If you're not in your place tonight where you should be, the message tonight is to you, you can get back in your place. You can get your heart right, your attitude right. You can get back in that place where God will bless you and show you mercy. Okay, so if you're out of place, he's saying get back in place. Because he's got a purpose for you right now. And I'm going to preach by the grace of God Sunday night a preview to the battle of Armageddon. And I'm going to show you that God is going to call people who have failed back to their place. You hear what I'm telling you? But tonight's the night, soldier. Tonight's the night, soldier, to get in your place. Get your attitude right, your heart right. If you've been walking in pride, it's time to get rid of that and start walking in humility and a submissive spirit. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And thank God for His mercy and His grace. And stay in that place and let nothing move you. Because I don't care what your failures have been in the past. God is saying, there's a place for you even in a coup d'etat. And you'll see it Sunday night by the grace of God. God has soldiers in the last days. He's going to come and put them back in their place. And that soldier's not just going to be a soldier. That soldier's going to be a warrior. There's hope for soldiers who are not in their place. There is a hope in the last days before Armageddon. There is a prophetic word that's going forth to the church. That if you have failed, God wants to bring you up. You are a soldier. That, watch this. You failed being a soldier. You failed when you prayed for somebody. You prayed when you served God. Hallelujah. You got slaughtered when you served God. But God's going to raise you up in that same place where you were slain. And turn you back into a warrior again. And I'll preach it to you. But I got to get this one in first. Because if we don't get our spirits right and our attitudes right and our tongues right. God is not pleased with the Lashon Hurrah. He is not pleased with the evil tongue. Of gossip and the evil tongue of trying to destroy your brothers and sisters with your tongue. God is not pleased with that. That is Lashon Hurrah. That is something that's very evil. So we got to get our hearts right. Mine, yours, careful with your tongue. This next year can't be like last year. We can't keep going in, going on, you know, in last year's failures and take them over into New Year's failures. No, God said, I'm fixed to raise you up. You failed, but I'm going to put you in your place and I'm going to make you a warrior. Hallelujah to the Lamb. But you got to get in your house. Got to get your heart right, your spirit right. I do too, brothers and sisters, to be honest with you. Hallelujah. I'm preaching this to me. Because, again, God's temple cannot be built with internal strife. Because His kingdom is built in the atmosphere of peace. You with me? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Thou shalt call his name Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his what? His government and what? Let's read it. What is this? How does this kingdom grow? And I'm not going to keep you long tonight. Isaiah 9. And six and seven. Does, it, does his kingdom grow in an atmosphere of strife and fussing and fighting and bitterness? And is that how it grows? That's why that internal strife has to be dealt with before the temple is ever built. So Isaiah 9. Here's what it says. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and what? Peace. There shall be no end. Upon the throne of who? David. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with what? Justice and with righteousness 
from henceforth even forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. God's kingdom doesn't grow in the atmosphere of constant bitterness, bickering, fussing, fighting, etc. It grows in the atmosphere of peace. And God said, i got to get rid of that internal strife before my temple can be built. Give God praise in the house. Because it will not be built without there being peace, without there being harmony. Because a greater than Solomon is here, and his name is Jesus. It's not about pasture. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not even about you ultimately. It's about Jesus Christ. And so, Shimei, you stay in the city of peace. You stay in Jerusalem. You stay in your place. And dwell there and go not forth from there anywhere. Now that, I mean, obviously, you know, if this guy had an attitude, he'd say, you know, Solomon, you're just trying to control me. You know, Adonijah would have the same attitude. Well, you're just trying to control me, Pastor. You try to tell me where I can't go and where I can't go and who I can hang around with and who I can't hang around with and all that stuff. I'm going to tell you something. Your heart's already been manifested. It's not my desire to control you. My desire is to help you. God wants to build his temple. God wants to build his church. But there must be an atmosphere of love and unity, not uniformity, and also repentance. Not defiance and rebellion, but repentance. So the fourth fellow that has to be removed before the temple can be built is Shimei. What's he going to do? For it shall be that on the day that thou goest out and passest over the brook Kidron, thou shalt know for certain that thou shalt surely die. Thy blood shall be upon thy own head. You understand? You know, God is so merciful. I, you know, thinking about something right now, my spirit set up here on this platform with a young woman years and years ago. And I told her, if you, if you get out of your place and you leave the church, I'm, I said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you. And I went step by step and I told her what was going to happen to her. And it happened. Not because I'm a prophet. I might be, but it wasn't because I have some kind of special revelation. Because when you go against the word of God, it's predictable. When you go against the will of God, hallelujah to the Lamb. It's, it's so predictable, brothers and sisters, because there's a science to it. He knows exactly what's coming to him if he leaves that place of mercy and peace. And Shimei said unto the king, the saying is good. As my Lord the king has said, so will thy servant do. And Shimei dwell in Jerusalem many days. Oh, he did good for a while, you know. He did good for about three years. But then he forgot about the mercy and the grace of God that was showed to him. He forgot about the word that came to him directly that he is responsible for in obeying. And so what happens? Came to pass at the end of three years. The two of the servants of Shimei, Shimei ran away unto Achish, son of Maacah, Maacah, king of Gath. And they told Shimei, saying, Behold, thy servants are in Gath. And Shimei rose and saddled his ass and went to Gath to Achish to seek his servants and Shimei went and brought his servants from Gath he again we have another example of a man who failed the test of submission because his heart wasn't right for about three years he did pretty good but as soon as he stepped out it was told Solomon that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and was come again and the king sent and called for Shemai and said unto him, Did I not make thee to swear by the Lord? And admonish thee, saying, No, for a certain on the day that thou goest out and walkest around anywhere that thou shalt surely die. And thou saidest unto me, thy, The word that I have heard is good. He left mercy. 
Why then hast thou not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I have charged thee with? The king said, Moreover to Shimei, thou knowest all the wickedness which, which thine heart is aware of, that thou didst to David my father. Therefore the Lord shall return thy wickedness upon thine own head. And King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, all who went out and fell upon him, and he died. And the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. And then now, now the throne, now the temple can be built. Because that internal, that strife, that coup d'etat is gone. I want God's church to grow. And I want to stay in the place, in my place. Because if we do, we will grow and we will be blessed. Are you understanding? And I know it's getting long. I know it's getting late. You understand that? I get that. But brothers and sisters, right now is not the time to backslide. This is not the time to backslide. We are so close to the sounding of a trumpet that's going to change everything. Hallelujah to the Lamb. With the sounding of that trumpet, it changed everything. And the true king came and reigned and ruled. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we're not very far off from the coming of the true king. Now, listen to me, church, as I come to a close. And I'm not judging anybody tonight. I'll let the word of God deal with us. But I will tell you right now, you can be sitting in the church and still be backslid. Now's not the time. You're too close, but you've lived too long for the Lord. Hallelujah. You've been in this too long, man, to quit fighting now. And you're not doing it on your own. God's mercy, His grace, His strength, His power, strength, salvation, security, power. In that altar, it's a place of refuge. You're in the right place. Don't let the enemy pull you out. Don't listen to the lies. And if there's anything in your heart, anything in my heart, that goes against the will and purpose of God and the anointing of God in our life, we need to get rid of that. If we're not right with our brothers and our sisters. And the Lord just kept talking to me. Even on the way here. He said Abner got out of his place. And he was slain. He was innocent. And so he talked to me today. And he said this is the place. As you look at that text. If they had walked in. It would have been all right. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. This is the attitude that you and I should have in the kingdom of God. Jesus went and sat up in a high mountain. On a high mountain. And what that means is he is speaking principles of his kingdom. His rule. And what are we supposed to be governed by? How are we supposed to be living? What attitude should I have is declared in the be attitudes of God's word. There's no mystery. You're not going to leave here tonight and say, I wonder if pastor was talking to me. This is the attitude that we should be having. And he spoke this to me. And he said, look, you can apply it to each one of those areas there in that word. He opened his mouth. He's up there on that mountain. and He's seated. He's on his throne there in that mountain, the kingdom. And uh, he seated with the disciples. The disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. To be poor in spirit means. You know you're nothing without God. So many things in this life. You can accomplish things. I can accomplish things in this life. That can cause us not to be poor in spirit. You know. We, we get this pride about us. To be in poor in spirit says. Oh Lord I need you. Amen. That's a principle of the kingdom. 
is to have an attitude of poverty. You know, he's he not wanting you to be, you know, uh, without money to buy what you need. You're poor in spirit. Hallelujah to the Lamb. For theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. This is the spirit we should have. Jesus, Lord God, are you thankful today that you have the Lord in your life? And, you know, you've done, so many of y'all have done so many things and accomplished so many things. And it's because the blessings of God is in your life. You've got to keep a poor spirit. Lord, I need you. I need you. Laodicea spirit, you know, we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Don't know you're blind, wretched, miserable, and naked. And I counsel you to buy me gold tried in the fire. I want to have a poor spirit. Blessed is are they that mourn, for they shall be what? Comforted. God, you know, you have a broken, brokenness about you, living for the Lord, and you're broken. You're just broken on the inside, right? God says... If we mourn, we shall be comforted. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hmm. And that mourning is not connected to like uh, being depressed. He's not talking about that. It's a mourning over sin. It's a mourning over coming short of God's glory. It's, it's a mourning over not having the right attitude, the right heart, the right spirit, the, the right thinking. You know what I'm saying? The right... Humility about us. That's what he's talking about. Mourning that way. They shall be what? Comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Meekness, see, that strength grown tender. It's not a prideful thing. And that's where Abiathar needed to go in a place of meekness. He needed to look at it. He needed to see it. He needed to understand the importance of humility. But the blessing comes, right? Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are you still hungry today? Are you still thirsty today? For righteousness, Solomon, walk in these commandments. Walk with the Lord and he will bless you. Blessed are the merciful, say the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. I thought about this today, and at my age, I'm getting younger in the spirit. Hallelujah. And I think as I get younger in the spirit, I'm getting younger in the body. Not in number. But I thought about this today. I need to store up some mercy. I need to sow some mercy. Because at my age, I'm going to need mercy. And if you want mercy to be showed to you, then you have to start giving mercy. Because when you give mercy, you're storing up mercy for yourself. If you want somebody to be merciful, see, it's real easy when you know you're walking exactly the way you should, right? And somebody's not or hasn't for you not to be merciful. But if you remember at some point, someday, you'll need mercy. And that means you got to sow some mercy. And I thought about this today. At my age, I'm going to start sowing some more mercy. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Because I need mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. Hallelujah to the Lamb. You know, the longer you pastor, the longer you preach, the, at least for me, the more merciful I'm becoming. And it's a work of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And I pray I've always had that in my spirit. But you know, when you're young, man, you're spitting fire. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're spitting fire, man. Praise God. You're, you know, you're like those two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Just burn everybody up. <laughs> you know, but the longer that you live for God, you, you, get, uh, you, you change. You know, it's, uh, it's tempered. And you, rec you recognize the importance of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If you want to obtain mercy, you have to be merciful. That means you're not going to give somebody what they deserve. Amen. Mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. The kingdom can only be built in an atmosphere of peace. 
peace and harmony. Solomon ruling, riding a mule. Peace and harmony in the kingdom. Got to get rid of all that internal strife before the temple can be built. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of what? Heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. You walk in this and you will be in your place. And this is the attitude that we should have. This is the spirit that we should have. This is the life that we should be living. And we do. We're literally walking in the kingdom of God as we do this. Let us follow this this coming year. And every time you and I are faced with a certain situation, go to this word right here and say, okay, this is what Jesus said. This is the attitude that I should have. Amen. This is how I can get in my place in this right here. And I might not get it in return. I might not get it back. But I'm going to manifest the spirit of the king. I'm going to put him in my heart. I'm going to exalt him on his throne. I'm going to put him on his rightful throne. He would just stand. Father God, I thank you today for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us this opportunity, God, to get where we need to be in our attitudes and hearts, spirits, and actions. You have a desire, Lord God, to show mercy and grace and administer peace and abundance in our life this upcoming year. Father, I believe that you want to add to this church daily such as should be saved. Father God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace in our life. God, we haven't always been what we should be. We haven't always done what we should do. But we look to you right now, God. We ask you to cleanse us with your blood. Father, we repent tonight. We give you glory and honor and praise. God, let this new year be a different kind of year. As we seek to follow you. And remain where we should be according to your word. That we would obey your word. And at times, God, our spirits will be tested. Our submission will be tested. But we will, by your help and strength, remain in a place of mercy. We love you and we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. Bless this church tonight as we go forth from this house. Father God, last Wednesday service... Before the new year comes, 2022. Father God, it's your will. It's your desire to do us good and not harm. Father, we are in a time right now where there is a preview to Armageddon. Let us be ready now. Let us be prepared now. Let us be in our place now, God. Father, we thank you for your ability to cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness right now. Remove it from our record. Let us change what we need to change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Before you're dismissed, look at somebody and bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. Love you. You're dismissed.